the first one I got the nickname in the hospital of um, really bad word idiot because I actually drove myself to the ER because I was home with my son alone. Yeah, exactly. I, like I went home, I fed the dogs, I <laughs> drove myself to the ER with an eye patch on like I do these days and it was just a bad thing and I developed these tics um, that you would notice I'd rub my hand, my thumb across my forehead because right down the center, I could feel a difference. Mm -hmm. Or if I, I would raise my hands up above my head all the time to make sure I still could, because that was uh, one of my, my symptoms was I couldn't raise my hands above my eye line. So I developed the nervous habit of constantly raising my hands above my head. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to episode 228 of the Recovery After Stroke podcast. To learn more about my guests, including links to their social media and other pages, and to download a free transcript of the entire interview, please go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. If you would like to support this podcast, the best way to do it is to leave a five-star review and a few words about what the show means to you on iTunes and Spotify. If you're watching on YouTube, comment below the video, uh, like this episode, and to get notifications of future episodes, subscribe to the show and hit the notifications bell. My guest today is Kyle Johnson, who experienced a brain hemorrhage at age 33 three brain hemorrhages at age 34, and then brain surgery. Kyle has overcome a lot and is still dealing with some of the things that stroke has left with him. Kyle Johnson, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Bill. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for reaching out and being on the podcast. You are, yeah, you are somebody who I can relate to a lot because the question, one of the questions that I ask people about uh, before they jump onto the podcast, just to determine that there's some kind of a stroke survivor is what kind of stroke did you have? And when did you have it? And how old were you at the time? And you've got here, you were 33, 34 times three, and then surgery at 34. And they were all hemorrhagic strokes. Tell me a little bit about what happened to you. Yeah, so uh, I didn't know any of this, obviously, until I was 33, uh, but I was born with what's called the pontine cavernous malformation of the brainstem. I don't think they could have made it any harder to say or pronounce or remember, but they did. Uh, so when I was 33, um, pretty much what happens, what I understand, I'm sure someone out there is going to correct me if I'm wrong, is the blood vessels, I like to call it, they get really close and they hug really tight and then they explode. So um, inside my brainstem, I had one of these uh, malformations and it just started bleeding one day. And uh, so that was in, I think it was July, 2016 was my first one. And then I had three more in 2017. It was 10 months and 13 days later was my first one. And then a couple of weeks later, or sorry, two months later was my third one. And then I, I'm not sure that my between my third and my fourth one ever really healed. Uh, and then the fourth one is when it got really bad where I, I couldn't move and I was just constantly throwing up blood. Um, so they I got rushed to the, the ER for that one. And of course, you know, all the nurses and everybody, they already had my bed made up and they knew me in their ICU at that point because I'd pretty much lived there. And then uh, they put me in pretty much a chemical induced coma for about a week while they figure out what they're going to do. And uh, what they ended up doing was a week later, they cut me down the back of my neck and took out a piece of my skull, put a tube in there, cleaned everything up on the inside, pulled it out, put a piece of titanium in there and sewed it back up and sent me on my way. Uh, so yeah, those 18 months were, give or take 18 months were pretty, pretty wild to say the least. Yeah, you bring back so many memories, not pleasant ones. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's had, the easy um, story. <laughs> oh my God, I had uh, a bleed in uh, Feb 2012, in March 2012, 
in November 2014 and then brain surgery in November 2014. And it's kind of the same thing. They sort of said to me, it may have never really healed. And that's why it continued to bleed out. And mine wasn't a cavernous malformation. Mine was a arteriovenous malformation, which is just in okay. a different location, but it's a similar kind of thing. Yeah, the and, EDM. And um, I didn't find myself particularly doing the anxious thing of worrying what about the next one or, or if I have a next one. But what I did do was I did do the whole, uh, is this another one for many years because I was having weird sensations, feelings, etc. Did you have the whole, is this another one? And then you were, well, surprised or whatever <laughs> to find out that in fact it was. How yeah. did that happen? What made so, you notice? Yeah, you know, that's, it's, that's actually a question I get a lot was, you know, knowing what the first one felt like, because the first one, I got the nickname in the hospital of um, really bad word idiot, because I actually drove myself to the ER, because I was home with my son alone. Yeah, exactly. I, like I went home, I fed the dogs, I <laughs> drove myself to the ER with an eye patch on like I do these days. And it was just a bad thing. And I developed these ticks um that you would notice i'd rub my hand my thumb across my forehead because right down the center i could feel a difference mm -hmm. or if i i would raise my hands up above my head all the time to make sure i still could because that was uh one of my my symptoms was i couldn't raise my hands above my eye line so i developed the nervous habit of constantly raising my hands above my head because i was always scared that it was going to have it again. And so much so that one of my buddies and I um, got together and he's a, he's a backend programmer and we built an app that this is really, this is not a plug or anything because it's not available anymore, but it was for me where um, it was an application where it could go in there and make it set on the phone to say, Hey, every duration of time, like two hours or an hour, you have to push something on your phone, like a medical alert to say, yep, I'm still alive, right? And if you didn't push the button or acknowledge it, it would give you a countdown. And then if you didn't do it still, it would then reach out through text message, through people you set as your contacts and show them like, hey, Kyle needs help. This is his last known location from GPS on the phone. That's how nervous I was wow. because I was, uh, you know, I think you've been through it, you know, it's a scary situation. And it, when it actually happened again, it was of course a bunch of denial where I was downstairs doing something and I was sort of feeling really weird. And I was like, yeah, I'm just really hungry. Right. So I ran upstairs and started eating and, the best way I could describe it was um, that I was the balloon and the water. So I was a water balloon and somebody took a needle and just popped the balloon. And I just felt, it just felt like rushing water out of my body. And that was the strongest indication besides my eye. Cause it did fix itself the first time and then it just stayed. But um so that was a really strong indication for the second one. And then the third one was just, I was really dizzy and didn't feel good. So I called up the doctor and she's like, yep, come in. And I was like, are you sure? And I remember her response was, you're bleeding from your brain. You might want to come in. I was like, okay. So I mean, because as you know, it's kind of expensive. Um, so, and then the, the last time was um, I had been thrown up. I, I couldn't lay uh, flat or sit up. Uh, so if I did any of those movements, I would automatically throw up and I just started throwing up blood a lot. And I called one of my buddies and he came and picked me up. And I'm glad to say I didn't vomit in his car the whole time. It's a huge win for me. Good on you, um, man. Yeah, I'm part of that one. But we got to the, the hospital and they're just like, you're back. I was like, hey guys, I just miss you so much. Like, let's go. So yeah, it was, it was trippy. And I know I, I'm sure you felt this too. It's uh, one of those where you want something to be done so bad about it because you have no life at a certain point. But at the same time, it's you, you want to be invited to the dance, but you don't want to go. 
So when they were like, hey, we're going to do surgery, it was like a sigh of relief, but at the same time, like, oh my God, what is actually happening type of situation. Yeah. So that yeah, yeah. That was scary. I remember exactly that third time uh, I was avoiding the surgery. You know, we can probably get away. Can we get away with it? Can we get away with it? And the yeah. third time my surgeon came in and said, we have to go in now. And she said, are you, are you up for it? And that was it. Sigh of relief. Yes. Let's get it done and dusted. She came back and checked up on me the second day and said, are you still on board with the surgery? And I said, well, yeah, I'm on board. I, I am. I, and I wasn't confident then I didn't respond confidently, but I was. And then we went through all the pre-op procedures and the pre-op procedures included, uh, you know, going in to get assessed for surgery. So it's a different kind of assessment. And then, and then the day of that assessment, which was about less than a week before surgery, as we were leaving the hospital and we were going through the emergency exit, well, the emergency area exit or whatever it's called, we, the ER, um, we, I started to feel uh, all, all my left side just, just go and my eyes, I couldn't see and I was freaking out and I was really scared. And I said to my wife, I'm experiencing all of this stuff right now and we cannot leave. We've got to go back to the ER and get somebody to look at us. And I remember we were heading to my parents' house and they were just waiting for us to go for dinner. And we rang them and said, something's wrong. We have to stay here. We're not leaving. Anyway, I got cleared after about another three or four hours and it was you know, well, well into the late hours of the night. And then we got sent home. And then a week after was surgery. Now, what what made it even worse for us, and I've mentioned it on a couple of previous podcast episodes, is that my mother-in-law had passed away and been buried literally a week before that. So we were just at our wits awesome. end. Like we didn't know what the hell was going on. And my wife broke down on the way home in the car, crying and having just a panic attack about what the next few days uh are going to be like and what's going to come of it and what's going to happen so yeah. it's pretty safe to say that i was relieved at one moment and then i was shitting myself for the rest of it 100 <laughs> percent. i yeah i mean i don't remember a lot of the week in between but what you're saying is 100 percent right and it's just one of those situations where it is the relief of like, all right, they're going to attempt to at least do something. But at the same time, because I wasn't coherent to a certain point, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's all of this stuff that they're talking at you mm -hmm. and with your family and stuff of like, well, he could die or this or this or this, right? And um, yeah, it, it's... I don't remember a lot of that piece, but I do remember the emotions that came with it. And I do remember the feeling of, I don't know if the word is dread or despair, but you know, your, your adults, your parents, your, your significant other, your caretaker at the time is there. And, you know, you, it's just, it's a hard situation to kind of wrap your head around unless you're in that situation, which I want to be very clear. I don't wish that upon anybody because it is a, fantastic situation to be in <laughs> that's yeah. just it's not fun yeah. um so yeah it's it's been it's been a journey and i think you know it's taken me i guess it's five years almost six years to be able to at least open up a little bit more about it in general uh just because i don't know about you but like i was mad for a very long time i was upset with my body I, I was, you know, the whole like, why me situation and, you know, genetics. Thank you so much for that one. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard to kind of wrap your head around. And, you know, I have more respect for my wife than I, I probably ever could. She's done more for me than any other human. She's what I call my superhero without a cape, <laughs> like jokingly slash really. Really? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we've been together 23 years now and she's she's been there through all of my stuff and all the ups and downs ups and downs sorry um and uh yeah it's it's a weird situation so i i can see that 100 percent of just 
that feeling of like what is gonna happen i don't know so yeah the only one way to find out is get through <laughs> and somehow try and see later like if you have that opportunity is to to just see what comes of it um i mean it's yeah. so difficult to I mean, that's not a very you know that's not a shallow conversation you can't just say oh let's see what happens well it's actually really deep but that's yeah. kind of where it starts it starts oh well let's just see what happens tomorrow and the next day and then in three months and then six months and then we'll see what continues to happen tell me a little bit let's go back to that section where you said that you didn't like yourself so what specifically about yourself didn't you like uh what were you angry at um i felt like my body betrayed me in a way um you know i've been we've been working out a lot doing the healthy thing and and i i always joke that i was probably in the best shape of my life so now i joke where i'm like i don't want to be in the, i'd rather be in the middle most shape of my life just to deter some of these chances again because inadvertently they found a second malformation when they were doing the surgery so there is a second one in there but i get mris and everything and nothing's going negative so far so high five on that one yeah. but from not liking myself it was it was a piece of anger that i i couldn't believe that i had something like this or that something like this could happen to me everybody always thinks that why me how did this happen and then it became um like a, a you know i think it's people always talk about the 12 steps right like anger denial whatever it is and then i went through the dial then i went through um you know researching just tons and tons and tons and my specific piece there's not a ton out there about it um and then just disbelief and then the acceptance of just losing that part of me and that's i think that's the piece that like if i had any advice to anybody it's just be nice to yourself if you've had a stroke and you're in recovery you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be you're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind like how long will it take to recover will i actually recover what things should i avoid in case i make matters worse doctors will explain things but obviously you've never had a stroke before you probably don't know what questions to ask if this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. Because you being mean to yourself and you hating or being angry, it's not gonna help at all. And I know it's hard to, to listen to someone and be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I'm just gonna wake up tomorrow and snap out of it. But that's the piece, like I'm on a couple of groups and you know, people ask for advice and I'm always, my response is, well, sleep, cause you need it. And two, be kind to yourself because if you're not kind to yourself, no one else is gonna be. Um, so to me, it was just anger. Just a, yeah. like, how could I, how could I do this to myself? You know? Mm. So, and you didn't really get there. You just, um, you're just going about trying to kind of come to some kind of terms of acceptance. And then you have to ask those crazy questions, which are not really real. You didn't really do anything to yourself. It's just a, yeah. that's the stage of the process. You got to ask yourself that question and then determine whether or not, is it re was it really me? And if it was, well, then how do I feel about myself? And then what am I going to yeah. do about it? And am I going to do something about it? Or am I just going to dive into the pits of depression? Uh, but in your case, it sounds like you went through the process of that they and they helped you get an answer, whether you liked it or not. And the answer helped you move forward into the next stage, you know, beyond denial and anger. Um, you know, it's kind of like grieve the, the whole grieving process did you do the bargaining stage where you were um 
if I get through this, I'll do this. Did you do any of that? <laughs> I can't even tell you how many times I did that. I think the first one was the worst by far. Cause so our son, Ryan, uh, was, he had just turned two, like right when my first stroke happened and I lost my father when I was right around two. So of course my mind is going absolutely insane. And I, there was a couple things I did in my mind that I think they're insane now, but they helped me at the time. So one was in my mind, this is really strange. So I apologize to everybody out there, but like, I would imagine my brainstem, like I close my eyes real tight. I'd match my brainstem and I would literally put stakes around it with caution tape in my mind and being like, nobody touch this unless you're going to help fix it. And then I would say to myself three things, get better, get home, play with Ryan. And those were the, and besides, you know, obviously Melissa, my wife, who's like, I've already said the best person ever. Uh, besides that, you know, being with him, you know, it's, it's understanding. I had to realize my why really fast of what am I in here for and what do I need to get out of here for? And that was probably something that I may have done inadvertently, but focusing on why I want to still be here and focusing on why I need to be out so I can be with my family and make sure that they're taken care of. And, you know, they don't see me with tubes and all the, the fun stuff inside me. <laughs> yeah. You're a really cool dude. I'll tell you why, because the symbolism of what you said about placing st stakes around your brainstem and then putting caution tape around that. I'm not sure if you actually realize how much of a positive influence impact that makes because it's creating neural pathways around protecting self protection of that zone and telling your body to be careful with it. That is actually something legitimate that's happening. So when I was waiting to learn how to walk again, I was imagining myself walk again yeah. for exactly the same reason. It creates a neural pathway, a neural process that is the same as if I was walking, even though I hadn't got back on my feet yet. So that when I got there and started walking, my body was familiar with walking, even though I hadn't physically done it because it had already created the pathways. So what you're doing is saying with the rest of your body, you're going, you guys that are handling, you know, this part of me, my brain, you guys need to take caution there. And you don't, and you need to not uh, create a negative impact in that space. And I'm not sure if you realize, but that is actually doing a world of good in your space. Visualization and having that kind of uh, approach to it and that kind of um, care that you're giving yourself in that space in your head is next level amazing. I, th I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And I, I didn't know that it was just, I thought it was something weird that I was doing to, you know, get through all the shenanigans that I was going through at the time. But how long did it, how long did it, if you don't mind me asking you a question, how long did it take you to regain your ability to walk and stuff like that? Within four, four weeks, I was walking again. I wouldn't say I was walking confidently or well or anything like that but i if to anyone who knew me i was upright i was walking as far as they were concerned the job was done you know so but after that what what came was uh the knee my left knee would collapse on me every so often and you know multiple times a day so when i'd be standing still in one spot it would collapse when i'd be walking it would collapse um, and that would make me feel like falling over um, it was always numb and it still is numb. So when I was getting used to uh, being on that leg again, I, I wouldn't know where the leg was in the world, like in space. And I'd put my foot down without thinking really like my old version. And then I'd be find myself on the ground uh, because my leg hadn't woken up to uh being on the ground yet my right side had but my left leg didn't know that it was supposed to be in the same situation and it would just collapse so i didn't feel good about walking probably for many years although nobody would have 
been able to tell. And what I find myself doing is leaning. I find myself off balance and leaning to the left a fair bit. And as I do it, which is even stranger when people are next to me, I find myself walking into their path or bumping into them. My wife continuously gets annoyed at me because just stop walking in front of me, would you? <laughs> so, yeah. so it took the best of a month for me to walk again and away from the wheelchair where I said to them, I'm, I'm going to walk without the wheelchair today. Um, but then, yeah, it was still rehab and still uh, outpatient rehab and still training to get it better. Yeah, no, I I have the same thing. My uh, I wobble when I walk, so I had so for you it was your left side, for me it was my right side. So during my surgery, my right side stopped working completely, and they came out and told my wife, my mom, and everything. They're like, well. You know, his right side's not working. His face is palsied on this side. You know, he's probably going to be in a wheelchair and he's going to have a, a feeding tube and all this stuff. And that was like halfway through the surgery. And that's what my family got to hear. So coming out of it, like, I guess it was a half hour, an hour um, before the end of the surgery, my arm just started doing this and they were like, we're done. <laughs> so that's when they patched me back up and exactly what you said you know i had to i think it was four or five different times was restarting with speech um like you know i see double vision and my eyes bounce so i haven't seen a static 3d image in like six or seven years and um exactly like what you said was so i had a walker because i lived in the hospital pretty much with rehab speech otpt all that super awesome great stuff and i left with the walker and I remember one day just being like, I'm either going to build confidence or reliance. There is no in between. And to be able to show my son, hey, adults are fallible. I have to correct myself to learn how to talk again, to understand language, to understand sounds and to walk. And if I fall, guess what, dude? Let's get back up. Let's go. And that was a really good, I hate to say it, but that was a really good takeaway for him to be able to see people struggle and to understand it's okay. And so to your point, it's, it's people don't know, but, but you know, you know that when you're a little wobbly or like my wife knows that she needs to walk on my right side, cause I'm going to bump into her first of all, and then I can't hear out of my left ear anymore. So it's kind of like it, she just holds real tight, you know, and I just bump into her walk into a wall or something. She's like, you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm still here. We're good to go. So I, I, I fully understand that. And you know, it goes back to the people that understand it a lot that you've been around or that we've been around that I, I probably say thank you too much to them uh, just because what they have done and what they're able to do versus a stranger on the street that they don't know, you know, they they look at you and they're just like, I'm sure you've heard this a million times. You look fine. Yeah. Right. Well, I can at least pull the card of like, ha ha, I don't look, <laughs> I don't look fine. So I got that going for me um but yeah it's that's crazy to to think of and do you ever look back and just think of in amazement almost of where you come from in a way like do you ever look so my wife makes me do this she like pulls out her phone and she'll make me watch a video of like me trying to move my hand or something or talk and she goes look at how far you've come and I'm like I don't want I don't want to see this like, I just don't, but she makes me watch it. I have a good disc. Do you ever get that sense of wanting to go back and watch or seeing stuff and you're just like trying to process it again? How, how did, how do you get through some of those things? So at the, at the beginning, it's traumatic. And yeah, I do think back and my, I don't have a lot of, you know, 10 years ago, there wasn't a lot of reason to, um, and I didn't know any better to record myself doing any of that stuff and post it on social media and you know share an inspiring story like a lot of people do nowadays which i think is amazing so um, i don't have much to look back at but we do have a lot of memories and my wife and my kids remind me um, sometimes when things come up but yeah um, that gratitude that whole um, super grateful for the fact that we've come through and i'm out of it and we somehow unskilled um, pretty much you know 
we were we were in our 30s but we were very childlike you know we had never really faced adversity we were very you know naive to the world still and then yep. and then we get to the point where we're dealing with this stuff and without having the skills uh from past experiences we found the skills and you know we we found a way through we made some good decisions we made some bad decisions M majority of them were good and we came out the other side um the thing about going back and reviewing the footage of you talking or you in hospital and all that kind of stuff it's traumatizing and i know a lot of people would like to avoid reliving the trauma but what that is is there's a psychological um process in counseling that people that a counselor will take you through which is specifically to expose you it's called exposure therapy to expose you to the trauma that you have experienced more than once regularly and what happens is then it becomes a memory of the exposure not of the trauma so it kind of separates you from the trauma and leaves the trauma in the past and then you talk about it and remember it from the next stage of the trauma which is the memory of it and then every memory that you're going back and remembering is a memory you're not remembering the trauma so what it does it's it's how you heal and leave trauma behind and that's why i say counseling 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 is the most important thing it's not the most important thing they're all the most important thing but in this context because what counseling does is it expose it allows you to talk about it regularly to a point where you eventually i kind of got sick of talking about the bad part of it and then i kind of made all these came up with all these conclusions and changed my opinion of what those conclusions were at the beginning i'll never be able to have a good life i'll never be able to do this all the i'll nevers and then it was like what are you doing now with your stroke I started a podcast. Oh, you started a podcast. Oh, okay. That's it. Tell me about that. And then it's like, would you have ever done that before? And it's like, no. Why did you start a podcast about stroke? Oh, I don't know. It was about this and about that. And then you get to this stage where you're doing these things that are because of the experience that you had. And you're trying to reconcile your new identity. It's like, who the hell am I? You know, why am I doing this? And why did that have to happen for me to do this? And then I started reflecting back on that trauma positively. Because it led to all these other things, all this growth. Yeah. And it's like, shit, that was a really bad experience. But oh my gosh, look how much good has come of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's something that my wife, like, I just keep going back to her because she's the one that kind of kept me in line, let's be real. Um, and she's probably the most positive person I know. And this is exactly right. I mean, I, I couldn't, you obviously said it way more eloquent than I ever could. Um, but it, that's exactly right. It's how do we, how do we look at the experience? Because like I said earlier, I wouldn't wish this on anybody. But at the end of the day, what positives can we take away from this? What can we share with people so that, you know, I, I get a lot of questions inadvertently about the stroke process or what I went through, or even, you know, some of the people I work with, they know that I've had things and they're asking how they can ask, right? And which I think is really cool that they're at least engaging and they're trying to understand because you know, being on this podcast is I'm an open book, right? If you ask me a question, I'm going to answer it. And they know that about me and we built those relationships. And it's really awesome for them to be able to hear the experiences and the things we went through and the things I went through, and then be able to say with somebody else that had something similar or something else, the cancer or whatever it may be, how do you approach them without them feeling weird about it? And then trying to engage on how to address you know, the very touchy subjects is really cool because then, you know, that makes them feel like they're part of a solution too. And, you know, it, one of the things that I've taken away is I've, I mean, I've always been the best person, let's be real. Um, but while I choke, hang on a second, while I choke on my tea. Yep. 
<laughs> um, exactly. So, I mean, it's one of those things where now it's like, okay, I can help other people learn to have a basic conversation about a human. And that's really, really neat to see is people wanting to understand how to have those conversations without, you know, the word offending or whatever. I think know, offense is necessary. I think it's okay to offend people yeah. because I'll tell you why. Um, because if your intention is not to offend and you offended, well, your intentions were, were, were really cool. So that's all right. I've got no problem with people coming to me, being afraid that they might offend me, saying the wrong thing and me getting offended. Because I, I know most people actually aren't attacking me specifically because I've done something wrong to them or they're coming after me. What they're doing is they're, they're trying to navigate this situation and they're learning how to. And they have the um, unfortunate experiences that every survivor of something is always going to respond differently to every other survivor of something. So they're never going to get it right. And what they have to start with is just ask a couple of questions like, is this something you'd like to talk about? And if it's not, yeah. that's it. End it there. And if it is, well, what is there something you prefer? we didn't discuss and that you know and then that person might answer well i'll let you know when we get there if we get there um but what i've found is although some people are in the in the denial phase and they're still not ready to talk about it really they're looking for the opportunity to talk about it to the right person in the right context and and they are and they just don't know who that's going to be or who they can open up to. That's why I love counseling because when you go to counseling, yeah, you're paying that person, but also they're creating a space where it's safe for you to be able to talk about it and express it and perhaps start moving through the stages so that you can start putting them behind you. Like, you know, the stages of grief, for example, and, um, and um, denial and, and anger and frustration and all that stuff. That's kind of what I see. I've had people on this podcast who hadn't spoken to anyone about their stroke for 10 years and thought that the first person on the planet that they should speak to about it was me. And it's like, <laughs> well, congratulations for that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. But like, I'm not sure why me, but whatever I'll go with it. And then also 10 years, I'm sorry that you had to wait 10 years. Um, but I'm glad you got there. So that's cool. And what they did is they put on a perception to the rest of the world that they that there was nothing wrong, that everything was okay. And I'm like you, I'm an open book. I can't do that. I can't pretend that something's okay because you see it all over my face that it's not okay. My behavior in my the way I speak and respond and talk. So what I'd rather do is when somebody says, man, are you all right today? You're not acting yourself or you're behaving inappropriately or whatever. I'm like, no, I am not all right today, you know, and thanks for picking me up on it and i'm sorry i'm gonna have to apologize for my behavior and and hopefully i'll be better tomorrow but i might not be i might just be the same shithead tomorrow that i was today and i'm not intending on being that way it just might be that no 100 i mean i think it's i don't know if it's harder to mask it now than it was like when you know, when I had a bad day before, it was like, all right, I can put it behind and whatever it is. Now, um, it, it, the smallest thing can just make me irritated or whatever it may be. And mm. I have these conversations all the time. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I just need a minute. I, I, I don't, I can't fix it. It's not something I can just snap out of. It's something that I have to just deal with. And you know, I appreciate you bringing to my attention and I will do my darndest to not continue to have that, but because I don't notice it, you know what I mean? Like, that's just the way it is for me at this, this point. And those people that bring it up, it's like, oh man, you got a booger in your nose or you got something in your teeth. Well, thank you for telling me so I can fix the situation. But for this one, I, I don't know if it's going to get fixed at the same timely manner as picking something out of my face. Um, so that goes with that gratitude of getting to getting those people on your side that are willing to tell you, Hey, you're being kind of a jerk. Are you being kind of a dick? Let's, let's fix this. Yeah. And you're like, well, I'm going to do my best. Um, bye. <laughs> so, yeah. um, yeah, those people are, are super helpful in 
in your life as well. Yeah, it's a two way street. You know, you got to take responsibility for when yeah. you're being an idiot and not blame the stroke, although it's caused by the stroke. I don't think you need to blame it forever in a day. It's impossible to continuously blame and outsource the responsibility of your behavior on the stroke. It's, it's not, it's us. So it's part of us now and we've got to find a way through. And sometimes there doesn't have to be a way through. There just has to be a really good apology. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's just acknowledging that. Yeah. Guess what? I, you're right. Perception is reality. And I've been a piece of crap today. Yeah. Um, I apologize. I will do my best to be better, but I own my, my actions and you know, I'm, I'm going to try. That's all I can say is I'm going to try and I apologize. I'm not Yoda. <laughs> like it's, yeah. it's going to be a try situation for yeah. me. Yeah. So. And the thing about it is, you know, you're living with a neurological condition. We do get irritated a lot easier, light sound, uh, too much sensory overload. And especially if you've got um, an eye condition like yourself, you've got nystagmus that is going to cause, you know, a level of, discomfort and irritation to your brain so it you're kind of already irritated without having gone into the public domain yet and what that's doing is it seems like you're short fused or whatever and it's getting you over the, you know a small comment get you over the line quickly but it's like no i've already had my irritations already today like as many as i can handle and this was the straw that broke the camel's back for example and it's like hmm Okay. I know you don't get that because there's no way you can get it because you have to be like me and I don't want you to be like me. But what I'm saying to you is just, you know, this is it. This is uh, we're, we're different people. We appear the same, but we are very, very different people. Yeah. We're wired. I had a coworker at one point that, you know, he broke his foot and whenever anything happened, he's like, ah, you get really frustrated really quick. And, this is after my everything happened and he looked at me and he's like, I never even thought about like how all, because like I used to have really bad headaches all the time and, you know, just trying to push through some stuff and, you know, he would bump his toe on something. He really frustrated. And one day he did it and I was just looking and he's like, I never even think about how you deal with stuff. I can't imagine having what you all have, what you, what you're dealing with all the time. And then having an injury, I was like, well, it takes it up a lot. <laughs> like when you get hurt or like you said, anything, unfortunately can become a trigger. Yeah. Um, it's just, how do you identify that and then try to mitigate it the best you possibly can to where, you know, uh, people around me know like, Hey, I just need a minute. I, I just need to go away and lay down for a minute, calm dark place and just get myself back. That's it, that's it. Um, and, you know, it's that whole piece of like, I appreciate you people for understanding that this is going to happen. There's, it's not a might. It is going to happen at some yeah. point in time. Um, and if it does, I apologize. <laughs> and I'll apologize after two. So, yeah, it's it's been a trip to say the least yeah so. yeah you know but yeah. what, what's been good about it it sounds like to me it sounds like that what's good about it is you've ha you've become more self-aware your it sounds like your self-awareness has just gone through the roof and that that can be positive that's only a positive surely yeah it's it you know before people that are going to watch this that know me you know i was i apologize to all you out there that do know me ahead of this uh and would agree with me on this when I was probably, I knew myself very well. I was very confident in who I was as a person. Let's be real, maybe a little overconfident. I'm looking at everybody else out there. Um, and what this has done is it's had to teach me to look inside more and really understand what I'm putting out is what I deserve back. And, and that's a weird way to put it, but mm. to your point, you do become more, self-aware to a certain extent because i know when i'm walking down a, a hallway or a street or something with my wife or my son that if i am wobbling or my gait my walk is off i know people are going to watch me right so you become that self-aware of like mm -hmm. what am i doing how am i acting are people going to think i'm weird 
you know, whatever it may be, um, or, you know, a lot of my stuff comes from humor, because as we all know, that's the best way to deal with bad tragedies. Um, so I, you know, plenty of conversations with my wife of like, that's not, <laughs> that wasn't quite where it needed to go with the conversation, you know, um, with dark humor. So it's having to understand and get repeatedly corrected to truly understand uh, yourself a little bit more. That's what I found for me is that I'd say these things and I'd be corrected and that would become something I'd be more mindful of. And I've had to build my own filters instead of naturally having them, um, which is probably better for me in the long run, let's be real. Uh, cause, cause I'm not sure you. my filter system was great to start with. Yeah. It sounds like it's you by design this time instead of you by default. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really fantastic way to put it actually. But is that, I mean, before it was, you know, like everybody could blame it on whatever you could say, like, oh, I grew up that way. I'm just blunt yeah. or whatever it is. But now it's, it's understanding that that I need to understand what's coming out of my mouth because I expect that to come back in a certain way. So it's been a lot of learnings and you are absolutely correct that you become, well, at least I did. I think it sounds like you did too, of becoming more self-aware of what you're saying, what you're physically doing, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's been a great learning experience. <laughs> um, probably a good thing I went through it at some point, let's be real, at the end of the day. Uh, but still, you know, it's been interesting to have to relearn all those different types of things of who you are as well. And mm -hmm. maybe things that you didn't want to acknowledge about yourself as well. So. <laughs> yeah, you got no choice now. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> one thing about humor that I like about humor is if it triggers you, it's worth exploring it. You know, that whole situation, dark humor whatever. And I follow obviously a lot of stroke survivors. And one person commented about um, a show that they were at. And it was a comedy show and the comedian made a joke about stroke. And the response on that person's social media profile was, you know, I went and saw this comedian and he made a joke about stroke. Stroke is no joke. You know, he's an absolute disgrace and all that kind of stuff. And that person got really offended that there was somebody on the other side of it who made a joke about stroke now i would have loved to have heard the joke about stroke i reckon i would have yeah. found it funny and laughed uh, but some people aren't in that stage where they're able to have a laugh at themselves or about their stroke or whatever and are focusing on the negatives instead of the positives more often than not and it it is really serious. There's no doubt about it. It's really serious. And so what? I mean, the fact that it's really serious and it's really hard and it's really terrible and all that kind of shit. So what? Like, and what are we going to do? Like, just get depressed because it. it is really serious? We may as well have a laugh about it because it's serious uh, to kind of turn it on its head and, and say, as serious as you think you are, stroke, like, no, I'm going to have a laugh about it. Yeah, you got to own it. And like, I've actually, a lot of people I know, like I'll, I make jokes, maybe inappropriately, but I make jokes a lot of like, Hey, of, of the stroke stuff. And I've had people come up to me and they're like, Hey man, you shouldn't talk like that. And I'm like, yo, I I'm owning this one. I'm allowed to, to joke and laugh because if I don't, other things are going to come out that are going to be worse. So I, I'm all for you know people that are able to bring a humorous side to the situation because as you said it's a shit situation yeah. but to at least have something unique come out of it even if it's a joke I mean, even a bad one whatever yeah. Yeah. but I, I just don't understand the whole i like okay maybe when it first happened i'd be a little bit pissy but i wouldn't you know yeah. rant and rave about it it's more of a you know, I, I used to joke with my friends all the time, like, oh, I remember when I was younger, this is the actual saying I used to say was, you know, I hope I brought my helmet because my my brain might explode. And then it did. 
And so, so now it's not like the funniest joke anymore because it was a reality thing, but I still say it or, you know, I don't know. It's just one of those things where if you can't laugh at yourself and the things that are going on around you, then I think you kind of need to reevaluate because one, you're still here and that is huge, right? You may have deficits, you may have whatever it is, but at the end of the day, just, we got to be happy with it and some things might offend you. I get it. But at the same time, it's a joke. I don't know. That's a whole other comedy conversation i guess it is huge um, it's a huge conversation but it's a really important one i'm not particularly qualified to have it but i know just from my yeah. perspective um <clears throat> the thing about um the thing about it is i with my mates i forever I, I was kind of the clumsy kind of guy and I'd, i end up finding myself falling over often and of course they would laugh at me and just because I had a brain brain surgery and le- had to learn how to walk again, if they were with me in my house when I fell over, they would laugh at me. Just because it was as a result of the the stroke or my clumsiness, I would like to think that even though it hurt and I got injured, you know, bruised, battered, not not kind of broken or anything, I would like to think that they would still laugh at me. Yeah, it's not malicious, <laughs> yeah. right? It, it's their it's, instinct. It's, it's their response. People falling is funny. I'm sorry. It is. I mean, I remember, so I have a pair of pants that I will never get rid of that are like these, it's like a, almost um, like a jogger material, not like, like a fleece or something, like really slick almost. And I remember one day after PT, I was sleeping and my, my father-in-law was at the house and I was wearing these pants and I went to get up and I swung my leg over the bed and I slid off the bed and straight into the nightstand and hit my head. It was the first time I'd fallen since I got out of the hospital and he hears a huge thud because, you know, I'm an adult male. And I'm laying on the floor and, you know, he might as well just painted a chalk outline around me. And he's like, dude, are you okay? And I was like, I have no idea what just happened. And I was like, I I seriously think my pants just slid me out of bed. And we just both started laughing because what are you going to do? And then I told um, my, my PT, my physical therapist that I fell and what happened? Because she was like, you know, as you know, they ask you all the time, like any falls, any whatever. And I was like, yeah, I fell out of bed. And we kind of going over. She started laughing. She's like, how in the hell do you fall out of bed like that? And I was like, I don't know, but I'm never wearing these pants again. I'm like 100% sure they're haunted. And it was a joke. It, it just turned into something that yep. became relatable to her too. Yep. And that's the, that's the piece that I think a lot of these people don't understand is these jokes come from a place to where I don't know about you, but it makes me feel more normal because yes. when they're making fun of everything else, yeah. but I, I'm the one left out group. Like, yes. I don't know. Like, yes. yeah, I, I want to be brought into the fold. I, I, I made dumb decisions. I did dumb stuff. Yeah. yeah. Bring me along. So I don't know. I, I think it's a way to, to relate to a person and, yeah you know, to make people feel more comfortable and, and to be involved, uh, you know, to acknowledge that that actually happened. And there's a comedian, uh, he has several, uh, several palsy, I think it is. And he talks about how he's disabled. And I, th- oh my gosh, I think it was like America's Got Talent or something. He was talking to Simon. He's like, we're the only minority group that you can join at any point in time. You just one bad bicycle ride away from joining our side. And when I heard that, I just started laughing. But yeah. I know people that got mad at the joke. And I'm like, one, ah, <laughs> you, nope, you cannot say that. Like, well, you can, I guess. But yeah. like, you can't be offended by something that literally has no impact on you at all, yeah. besides making you laugh on the inside, because you know that was funny. That's it. Um, and that's the, that's the piece it's, you know, it's the, the people that want to protect you or protect others from that kind of stuff. But at the same time, like 
I don't need protection, man. I know it's funny. I know what I find funny. If I don't like it, I'm going to turn it off. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I, maybe this is that dark humor piece, but I, 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 I love it. I love it because you just reminded me of a comedian that we used to um, have here who was popular in the 90s. Uh, he's an Australian guy. His real name was Christopher, is Christopher Widows. And his stage name is Steady Eddie. And he has cerebral palsy. Okay. And the guy's not steady. It's yeah. it's a it's a sick Aussie humor thing that we do. When somebody's short, we call them stretch or tall. When somebody's yeah. tall, we call them small. Um, so Steady Eddie was on stage breaking down those types of barriers in the 90s. And he was just take, hanging it on himself the entire time. He was talking about things like dating, about you know, driving about public transport, you name it. He was talking about everything. And we, because we didn't, because I was a lot younger in the nineties and I didn't have a filter of how people might get hurt, offended or whatever. I just took this guy at his word, whatever he told me coming from his perspective of the world to me, it was absolutely hilarious. And I know some people might've got upset with him or whatever, but I thought he was amazing. And he was the only disabled uh, person, whether they were on TV or movies or wherever, that I had ever seen being himself on stage in front of sold out crowds, sold out shows. So it's like, how can we take that away from this guy? How can we decide what is or isn't funny? And how can we not allow him to express himself in a way that helps him get through all the stuff that he's got to get through every single day of his entire life from the day he was born. Um, he's had to break down so many barriers to overcome the condition. His, you know, his, his upbringing sounds like it was amazing, but his physical abilities were not even with the majority of the people. So he had to work harder much, much harder to get to that point where he was actually being his authentic self and living his true life. So I'm not going to take away his dark, sick jokes um, about cerebral palsy. Not in, not in a million years. I loved it. Yep. Um, so that's kind of the way I see it. You know, I think everything is um, potentially open for uh, a little bit of well, like everything's open for criticism, everything's open for comedy, I think. So yeah. um, it's lovely to have a conversation with you and go so deeply into the conversation. Um, I love it. So just to move along a little bit, because I want to get to know a bit about you. What were you doing before all of this stuff? And how were you going about life under quote unquote normal conditions? Um, it was, you know, I, I picturesque would be a, a good word for it. You know, my wife and I, we've been together since high school type of situation. And we had moved out to Minnesota for work. And we were there for four, sorry, um, a couple of years. And um, the company, we both worked for the same company. And they went through some layoffs. So I was part of it went to another company and just things were not going well with the company itself. So I voluntarily left, was doing my own thing. And we were working out, we were doing the right stuff for our bodies. And we were just being 30 year olds, you know, we had a kid and we were trying to raise them the best of our ability. And, you know, to your point, we had a few things that had gone wrong in our lives that we both struggled with at one point, but it, you know, it wasn't like anything absolutely insane you know that we'd had to deal with and uh you know when all this started happening was really i look back at it i'm like god i was so stupid um like my wife had to go to portland or something for work so i was home alone with our son and we were working out a lot like i said and we were on our deload week where we lower our weights just to do that kind of stuff and i remember you know, I used to throw them in the air like every dad loves to do is throw their kid and make their wife freak out. Yeah. So I was doing that and I realized I couldn't get my hands up. And 
I was just like, well, I got a tension nerve in my back. I don't know, whatever, because nothing else is really wrong. And uh, then she left and, you know, just kind of perpetuated and then, which the perpetuate, you know, perpetual part right there, um, just kind of continued on. And I remember waking up that Monday to take him to school and I could only see like, you know, 20 feet in front of me without it being crossed. And I was like, oh, this is weird. I must have just slept wrong. I don't know. So I took him to school, came back and, you know, or to daycare or whatever it was. Then I picked him up later. And the next day it was like, I could only see like, you know, two feet or three feet. I'm like, what is going on? And I put knife, I literally put an eye patch on from his Halloween collection and drove him to school. And on the way back, I called my wife and I was like, hey, um, I'm not feeling real good. You know, I feel like my face is numb. Noises are freaking me out. Like I can't hear bass. Like I just couldn't understand certain things. So she called, we had, her, her company had a nurse line and uh, they're like, hey, the things you described haven't called us right now. So uh, she called me back and she's like, hey, they want you to call her. I was like, oh, come on, man. So I pull into the gas station, still got my patch on. Um, and I'm pumping gas and I'm talking to the lady and I'm starting to slur. And it was one of those things where she's like, get off the phone, get to the hospital right now. And I was like, whatever, I'm home alone. Who's going to feed the dogs, right? So I said, just pumping gas, go home, feed the dogs. And at that point, I realized that like, I couldn't really see very well. And my right side was going numb. Like, it was just a lot of things just like, something might be wrong so luckily there were, there was a hospital uh not that far from where we lived at the time and i remember parking stumbling into the hospital and then like falling in the admissions chair and the lady just looked at me and i couldn't understand her i couldn't do anything she just looked at him and she's like we're going back went and got a wheelchair they did an mri and by the time i came out of the mri i couldn't talk couldn't see nothing but my wife knew that I was going to the hospital so uh, I just handed the doctor my phone and she called my wife and you know my wife's expecting me on the other end and it's our doctor being like well you know he doesn't have anything but he, he does have a he's having a stroke right now and he's bleeding his brain and we don't know what's going to happen and all this stuff so that was interesting you know, I, I kind of knocked it out for a while, but it was, we were just kids. I, it, I know this is weird to say, but like, you know, going to concerts, going to plays, you know, doing normal family stuff. And, yeah. you know, it's been a challenge. You know, we used to love going to um, like Minnesota's future concerts for music and stuff like that. And we would try to go to concerts all the time. And now like I have to wear headphones if it's too loud, like, you know, I'm an old person. Yep. I'm like, ah, oh, it's too loud. I can't do this. Um, so it's that that the, the overload. You know, right. I, I like I don't like being around a ton of people around me all yep. the time. It's just you know little things you learn. And now I work from home, so this is literally my office yep. and my bedroom. So this is this works out perfect for me. Um, so yeah, it's been it's you know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Perpetual pirate is your Instagram name. And can you yeah. tell us why you're the perpetual pirate? Because for people that aren't watching on YouTube, they're listening yeah. to this. Why are you the perpetual pirate? So, um, and I first started my Instagram account. It was, no, I like everyone. It was just like a, whatever, a type of social media account. And, um, after my first stroke, I, I love cars. I, I mean, you've probably seen some of them. I love cars. I love, at least I, I, I took a little hiatus because driving was a little bit challenging to get back to, but I loved it. And when my, uh, when my eye refused to turn back to being normal, I wear an eye patch everywhere I drive. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to own this. This is, this is me. I am the perpetual pirate. I'm never getting rid of this eye patch. I'm in this forever, as they would say on the Instagram taglines and reels and all that stuff. And um, it just, 
this is something I got to own, right? You own, you own w- what's happening around you. And that's yeah. one of those things where I'm taking it back. It's mine. I'm owning it. And if somebody asks, absolutely, let's talk about it. So gives you a bit that's of power. Like, yeah, exactly. I'm not going to let it own me. I'm owning it. It may take me down at some point, but the whole time I want to fight. Um, so yeah, that's just where it comes from. It's just more of a little poke at yeah. it to say the least yeah a lot of people uh struggle when they look in the mirror and see the way that their face has changed and um, i'm looking at the photo on your instagram the uh, profile photo it's you and your wife and your baby yep and you know there's an obvious change between that photo and now yeah how did you come to terms with that have you come to terms with it what's it like when you look in the mirror i i hate it so i mean just to boil it down to that i absolutely hate looking to the mirror still i i I mean i've gone past all the anger and all the jazz but at the same time um so like even at work right like i have my reading glasses that are reflective so that way when I put them on you can only see the screen through my eyes so people don't really tell that my eyes are weird or different I should say um so I I'm not a super fan of looking at myself in the mirror although you know I tell my wife that you know she's got a good blessing because half my face is going to be wrinkle free when we're like 80 so I'm going to be looking like a new babe right <laughs> um but at the end of the day I, I don't like looking at my face and people are like oh I don't understand why I'm like well it's hard to explain it's yeah. I know what I know what I want to look like I know what I used to look like but it's never coming back so you know as long as my teeth are clean and my nose is clean you know I'm buzzed once in a while I don't I don't know. It's just not something I, I walk into the mirror. And I'm like, all right, let's do this type of situation. So yeah. I'd say that's probably one of the biggest lingering effects is, you know, I, I would say my eye line tends to naturally just go down when I'm in front of the mirror versus looking straight at myself. Yeah. But that's a really good question, actually, because you're, you're absolutely right. There are certain things that I keep that photo and actually it's right back here Mm -hmm. right there Mm -hmm. um and that's one of my that's one of my favorite photos that was when we were working out a lot we just had ryan things are going well and then you know 18 months later whatever it was just kind of took it out so that's one of my favorite family photos of that is one i can look back at and be like i loved that time period um just of one you know, you're in shape, you, you know, just happy memories from that point. Yeah. And yeah, so it's, uh, yeah. And you're, and you're still <laughs> ob- oblivious to the real world, aren't you? You're still kind of really oblivious. All the problems that you're living with, you probably created in your own head up until they actually occurred. And then it's like, okay, yeah. there's a completely different set of problems that I'm not prepared for. And I didn't <laughs> know were part of my life um, yeah. for sure. So do you feel like there will be a time where you'll have fun memories, just like the ones that you described from that time? Do you feel like you've made some of those now in this new stage? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you probably experienced this. And if you haven't, please tell me you haven't. But there has been, I'm going to start with this part, and it kind of leads into it, which there's been a shift in relationships from friends, family, whatever it is, to what it was, to what it is now. Uh, you know, the people that, if somebody is watching this or going to watch it, I apologize if this is your feelings, but at the same time, it is what it is, right? Where it's, you know, the people that are like, oh, I can, I can be there, whatever you need help with, just let me know. And then you ask them and they're just like, oh, I'm, I'm cleaning my eyebrows that day you're like all right cool um so that piece is something to kind of think about is the relationship pieces that are moving forward to where those are the happy memories that i focus on right is meeting the new people 
that I become friendly with and, you know, I can be myself at this stage where it's not, they remember me from what I was and all the things I was able to do and I could do at that point in time. But these are the people that know me now. These are the people that understand what I'm capable of now and appreciate that. Mm. And those are the memories that I remember of joking around and having a great time and watching our kids play and all the little things that you would do normally, but they only know me as this. So it allows them to not have those bias, those preconceived notions of like, Kyle used to be able to do that, or he used to maybe say this instead, but now they know me as this. And that's how I'm accepted as this. And that, that is those, that, that's the building blocks of the memories for me is knowing the people that accept me for who I am and will actually be there and have fun. You know, I, like you said earlier, I have plenty of people that we joke around all the time about my face not working or my eyes being silly or whatever it may be, because it's funny. And a lot of the old people I knew yes, wouldn't necessarily have those kind of jokes. But the people that knew me at this stage, it's fair game, man. And it's okay. Yeah. So looking back, it's looking at those memories that mean more to me yeah. than, than a lot of the, the older ones that people I don't talk to anymore or yeah. uh, relationships that may not be there anymore either. So yeah. like you said, it's almost like remembering the memories to overtake the old ones in a way. Yeah. So, yeah. so you know, the previous people who were kind of in your life and now they're out for whatever reason, you think about it, like they've, they've gone through a trauma too. They've gone through yeah. the trauma of seeing their friend who was well, looked like this, who was unwell, looks like that. And they're grappling with their own mortality because of your potential mortality. And they're grappling with the identities change that they've had just by seeing that how your identity has shifted. They used to relate to you in this way and they don't know or they're not capable of expanding the way that they relate to people beyond, say, going to the football or or going to the pub or whatever it was and then it's like well what, what do i do now and yeah i want to help the guy because he's a great guy and is worth helping but when he asks i hope he never asks because when he asks that's going to be a really difficult time for me because i'm not going to feel comfortable being there because i'm not i'm not the i'm not well enough or i'm not strong enough or i'm not i don't have the the capacity to support him emotionally or in these other ways yeah i can lift a box and move it and i can push a you know push a chair or you know pick up a bed and relocate it or whatever but man, i don't have the emotional capacity to be around that guy because he's evolved and i'm not evolved to that extent yet i'm still the guy who's appears like an adult appears like he has some life experience, but really is 35, 36, 37, and hasn't really had any life experience because everything's been picture perfect so far. And they've only ever lived with the perception of problems that they created in their head because they didn't have any problems and they probably felt left out and they thought they should have some. So they went about creating some. Do you know what I mean? 100%. Yeah. It's, you know, and I think that's the other piece that comes with all this learning is that one of the things I've had to do, and I did this a lot when all of this stuff first happened, and it took me a little bit to realize I was being a total dick while doing it, which is comparative or being comparing. Um, because at the end of the day, the stuff I went through sucks. And you know, it, I, I think for you, me, the people that have gone through this, it's easy to do that one up where you're like, well. You had what I had four, but I don't know what to tell you. I'm like, I got you, you know, to where it's like, I've had to learn and understand that, that what people are going through, that is their own stuff. And that may be the worst thing that's happened to them. And you know what? I, I'm happy that that is the worst thing that has happened to them. Yes. And if that is what's throwing you through a loop is you stepped on a Lego and you think you're dying, have at it, man express yourself do what you need to do 
I, I'm not comparing anymore. I'm not. I, I mean, yes, do I get judgy? Let's be real. I'm human. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, it's your experiences and what you're going through are your own. And I wish you the absolute best getting through it. Um, and, you know, being that I have gone through some of these things, if you need help, let me know. I don't know what I, I, I can't lift boxes for you or move a bed, but I could help you do something else maybe. Um, so yeah, it's, it's that understanding piece of like, yeah, I may have gone through some shit, but whatever you're going through is most important to you. And I have to, I don't know if the words appreciate, but understand it, I guess would yeah. be the, the, the bit, the better word for it is at least understand that yeah. what you're going through means more to you than, you know, what it might mean to somebody else. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's a really wise way to say it because what that does is it doesn't make hopefully the other person feel guilty. Uh, and you're not doing that. What you're doing is going, Hey, you do you, I'll do me. And you know, if, if we come, to cross paths again we cross paths again and we'll work it out then i had a friend of mine who uh i was really you know tight with for many years and then when he got uh married you know and i was married you know we it, it kind of continued on and we did all that stuff and then and then he got divorced and then we never heard from him again and we didn't hear from him again for a long time and i hear that a lot because people don't know how to relate to you without their partner at a family gathering or a function or whatever and it's like okay I, I i appreciate that to an extent and then and then he found out that i was unwell but he still didn't make a contact he still didn't reach out or anything like that and then he contacted and then we ran we ran into each other at a, at a local venue one time and then he said to me man uh oh sorry i haven't called and all that kind of stuff and i'm like hmm, whatever man you don't need to apologize for it you know I know you're really unwell and sick. I said to me, yeah, same, you know, it's all good. Don't worry about it. You know, no, no big deal. And then to me, it just felt like even if we kind of rekindled our friendship or tried to do something for him, it still would have been uncomfortable and bad. And mm. I, I think it's nicer to just let him go so that yeah. he's not perpetually feeling uncomfortable and bad about yeah. what he has or hasn't done or how he has or hasn't behaved. I forgive you. I don't really mind. I'm not holding a grudge, but also don't have the the desire to hang around and be with you while you're going through that phase because I'm done with that phase. Like I don't have that. Uh, so I'll just I'll just do me. You continue to do you, and I'll always say hello to you if I see you on the street and chat to you and find out how you're going and all that sort of stuff. But I I just don't really feel like we're at the same place to ha hang out together and and spend time. So. That's all good. But you know what? That's okay. Mm. And I, the people that say it's not have never had a falling out. <laughs> Let's be real. I mean, you, you, you hear these things all the time of like, oh, we just grew apart or whatever mm. it is. Yeah. People grow apart. It. it just happens to be that you and I had something that snapped us apart. Yeah. And it, that's just the way the world works. And you're absolutely right to the point where now I, this is me being selfish and I'll admit this all day long. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't have, or want to have the energy to put forth on something like that That's it. where, yeah, like my wife and I are the same. Like if something, I, I, I don't want to say we make snap judgments, but we evaluate the situation and we're like, you know what? I do not have the emotional capacity mm -hmm. to deal with, whatever you are going through i apologize and i will be here on whatever you need but at the same time you know i had to own my own shit like let's yeah. let's step in and if we need to get through it let's get through it but at the same time like i, I just don't have the emotional capacity i used to have yeah to to spend on that like to me it's i i deeply apologize and i'll be there to help you but at the same time i want to go hang out with my son I want to go take him somewhere do mini golf or play video games or something. And, you know, no offense, but I, I want to do that. I, I, I mean, I'd love to help you, but at the same time, jog on. Yeah. Um, and that's harsh and I get it. That's also me being selfish. 
yeah. uh, to protect my own self from getting wrapped up or involved in the next level of whatever you want to That's call it. it. Yeah. And you're prioritizing your time, which is amazing because we don't do that, right? We often don't yeah. do that. And now you're going, hang on a sec. Let me see what I value more. I value that more. That's going to bring me more joy, more happiness. It's going to be better for my long-term well-being. It's going to be better for um, what I'm trying to put out in the world, or how I'm trying to raise my son, all that kind of stuff. And it's like, wow, okay. I know what my values are. That's where I need to put my energy because that's ultimately why I was put on the planet why I decided to have kids. The rest of it is up to you. It's your journey. Yeah. You work that out and um, you will. You'll get through. You'll find a way. There's no doubt about it. If you keep searching for answers, you'll get answers. If you keep looking for problems, you'll get problems. So it's all good. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I apologize. I don't remember his name, but one of the one of your other podcasts, there's a guy that started with, he loves the American saying, if you I apologize. It was something along like, if you're an asshole, you're going to keep finding problems or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I love that line because it's so true and you can extrapolate it to so many different types of scenarios where, you know, it's cliche, like, oh, put the positive out in the world and, you know, you can manifest. That's it. Well, I can't manifest new brains down. I can, you know, I can want to do all these things and put all these positives into the world. But at the end of the day, my actions have consequences and my actions that I get to spend with my son and I get to teach him to be the right person or perceivably the right person or, you know, all those different things is, you know, communication is key as long as it leads to action, as far as I'm concerned, because yeah. we can talk about all this stuff all day long, but if you don't go out in the world and make it a better place on your own, or if you don't do all these things on your own, again, what are you doing, man? Yeah. Like, let's step in and let's do this and you doing a podcast where people can truly understand and express and you give them the platform to do these things and have people listen and maybe learn a little bit about what people have gone through from a caretaker perspective or you know from an actual survivor or whatever it may be I think that's an absolutely beautiful thing to do and it sheds light on something where you know not every stroke survivor is 65 or 70 That's you know it. it's it's it can happen to anybody yeah. and, and having people see that and 70 year olds yeah. are going through the same thing we're going through and the 83 year olds they're all going through the yeah. same thing yeah the guy yeah. who you mentioned was rodrigo sanma he's yes. a, a mexican film uh maker and he was episode 207 and he was such a cool dude to speak to and um if anyone is curious about that line what it is as soon as you go and listen to the podcast it's literally the first minute i've clipped it and put it at the beginning because it's such a good line um and yeah it's it's true that's kind of you get what you focus on is basically what he's saying but he has a beautiful way of uh, expressing that i had a really good time uh chatting with rodrigo and he's like you you know he's physically and spiritually spiritually and emotionally altered from this and he is making the best uh of it and he's doing amazing things in mexico um, as well as um filming uh uh doing you know documentaries and all the stuff that he used to do he's also building some amazing sustainable home and all this kind of stuff wow. you know really economical very eco-friendly and it's like wow you go man and all this sort of started after the stroke for him and it's yeah. like what an amazing thing uh i'm not sure i didn't ask him if it would have been the case anyway but it seems to be his new passion project you know he's going all out trying to get this thing off the ground and um i think they're going to be build, building hundreds of homes uh for people um at a different uh with this different idea so yeah that's Rod rodrigo i've really enjoyed chatting with you man um I like your philosophy. I love the way you, you're going about your recovery. And I really appreciate you reaching out and connecting with me and asking to be on the podcast. I love it when people contact me to be on the show. It makes me feel like that, like it's better than dragging people along to the show. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. And that's why I said earlier, it's like, I really appreciate the platform to allow people to do this and allow people to express different facets that, I think you said earlier, if you haven't gone through this, mm. 
the thought process of the random things don't come into play with a normal person. The normie, as you know, cool kids say these days, the handy capable. Um, but you know, I think that you doing this alone and allowing people to express themselves, um, which is hard. Let's be real. It's not easy to come out here and, and to share your story all the time. Um, so, but it is wonderful for people to hear the emotion that comes out of it. And my story is not the same as anybody else's, but I'm not saying it's worse. I'm not saying it's better. It's just an experience of the human collective that people need to hear or, you know, if they want to totally. That's it. To that's them. it. Yeah. <laughs> um so yeah no i appreciate you having me on and i appreciate the time very much man you're welcome um and you know that thing about the podcast is i've done it for my family to hear (laughs) they don't listen but i've done it because (laughs) what i'm thinking is if they choose to listen instead of me telling them which is something i used to do a lot they can come themselves instead of taking the uh Muhammad to the mountain or what is it moving mountain or something like that yeah something. yeah there's a saying there about you know like not pushing it onto people it's just about creating the space for it and then if people want to come they'll come when they're ready you know and and I'm yeah. and I'm really good with that really good with that I have no problem with that plenty of people are coming you know this month we're on track to get 6000 downloads of the podcast oh wow yeah that's never happened before so I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited that um, we're going to probably crack the 6,000 downloads uh, for the podcast, which means that perhaps there's not 6,000 people listening simultaneously, but there's more than 210 episodes now. And then there's a whole bunch of content that they can go to. So wherever stroke survivors uh, uh, are in their journey, wherever they are on their journey, they'll be able to relate to different people uh, throughout the podcast i want to make it the biggest podcast for the number of stroke survivors that have been interviewed in one place ever that's kind of my goal now so there is unfortunately too many of us uh one yeah. in four people are going to have a stroke in their lifetime and if you think about the size of the population of the planet where there's something like seven billion of us that's more than a billion people at least are going to have you know nearly two billion people are going to have a stroke in their lifetime so and when i was going through this there was nothing i couldn't go anywhere to get information there was some amazing communities locally that were doing good things but there wasn't enough the way that i like to consume uh you know this type of content about stroke it was uh, this to me can be very passive because if I'm, if I'm driving, I put an episode on, or if I'm in the train, I can put an episode on and I can just put one on in the background. If nobody's home and I'm not bothering anybody, I can just listen. So that's kind of the beauty of it. You know, it can be real passive and you get, and how lucky am I to speak to 210 or more stroke survivors and tell me their version of it, just so I can become better about myself and feel better about myself at the same time. I mean, it's such a gift and a blessing and a everything either way. You know, I know, I know it goes both ways. You, everyone thanks me. And it's like, you, you're the same. Like I feel the same for you. This just may as well have been the first episode. It doesn't make a difference to me. It's so amazing. I don't know how much you have to talk about your stroke, but I haven't got enough about it yet. I'm 210 episodes in and I still haven't spoken, stopped speaking about it. I still feel the need to continue speaking about it. So this is more of a gift because of the other people that are helping me. Uh, so that's, it's not more of a gift. It's just as much as a, 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 of a gift to me, you know? So thank yeah. you and uh, be well and have an amazing recovery and uh, enjoy the rest of, you know, the next chapter of your life. I appreciate that. And, uh, Anybody that's listening out there is is more than welcome to reach out to the person around them and make sure that they're doing okay. I think that's one of the pieces we talked about earlier is just making sure that you know the person next to you. So if anything does come up, 
you can make that decision, that quick decision that could possibly save the life because that's where it all just starts is having those human contacts where you know each other well enough to understand if something's right or wrong. So no, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And, you know, have a wonderful night. And obviously I'll be listening uh, to the next ones and the next one after that. So thank you very much. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks. That's a wrap. What a cool chat, awesome. man. I mean, no, I appreciate it. What a really cool, deep chat. I really appreciate it too. Um, thanks for coming on. It's just a lot of fun being here all the way in Australia and having a chat to somebody from the other side of the planet who I felt like I've known for ages, <laughs> who I've just met and know nothing <laughs> else about. You know, it's unreal. Yeah. I, no, I. I said it before and I said it on that is like, I'm one of us serious. Thanks for letting, I know it's not just me. I know yeah. you're getting stuff out of it too, but at the same time, you know, it, it's taken me. I think, I think that I've been able to talk about it and maybe express on like little micro doses here and there. Um, and recently at, at the company I work at, um, I did like a whole presentation to like 60 or 70 people about, wow. it wasn't necessarily directly about me, but it was about my experiences and how it can be translated to what we talked about at the very end is knowing the people around you and knowing if something is wrong, you can make that quick decision. And it, it's just awesome to be able to, like you said, have these conversations to people around the world at this point in time. And, mm -hmm. Um, it's beautiful to have these shared experiences. They're shitty experiences, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But to have that network of shared experiences is a beautiful thing. And I agree with you. There is not a lot out there for us to research. There's not a lot out there to listen to. I mean, there's people on Instagram. There's, you know, things like that. But to your point, it, like, I remember just researching and finding nothing and asking doctors and they're like, ah, yeah, go to PT. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks. Um, so no, this is wonderful. I appreciate it very much. And um, yeah, I, I, that's the easiest way I can put it is thank My you. Pleasure. Thanks for joining us on today's episode. Sharing the show with family and friends on social media will make it possible for people like you who may need this type of content to find it easier. And that may make a massive difference to someone that is on the road to recovery after their own experience with stroke. Also, if you are a stroke survivor with a story to share about your experience, come and join me on the show. The interviews are not scripted. You do not have to plan for them. All you need to do to qualify is be a stroke survivor care for somebody who is a stroke survivor or be one of the fabulous people that help out stroke survivors. Just go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact, fill out the contact form. And as soon as I receive your request, I will respond with more details on how you can choose a time that works for you and me to meet over Zoom. Thanks again for being here and listening. I really appreciate you and see you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation 
consultation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call triple zero if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy, currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.